We are The Table, and we are so glad that you have taken time out of your week to join us. Here at The Table, it is our hope to move you forward in life and faith over the course of this message. At The Table, we do things just a bit differently. We pose questions in real time, and we want to give you some time to wrestle with those questions as well. Again, thanks for joining us, and we hope that this message moves you forward. Where's that weather? I'm ready for some warmth. Today we begin a new series. By the way, my name is Brad. If you're new here, we're so glad that you're here. Um, they tell me that I'm the pastor here. Uh, sometimes I'm not really sure because I don't, I don't always feel like it, but that's what they tell me. So today you get me. Um, but we begin a new series uh, called 100. And um, I'll just be honest. Uh, I'm, I'm excited for this series because this is a series that, that I feel like God has been speaking to me about in my own life. Uh, I'm not going to preach to you about something that I'm not working on myself. Is that fair? Like, can we do this together? So, so uh, what I love is that God has been speaking to me over the last year about how I financially manage the resources that he has blessed me with. And, and I'm still figuring that out. I'm not always good at it. And, and, uh, but I feel like, hey, like one way that I can honor God in my own life is the way that I financially manage my money and the resources that he's given me. And what I know is that for you and me, oftentimes we treat our financial plans like diets, right? We we want the quick fix for long-term success. And what I know in diets is we get focused on what we do rather than who we are becoming. Are you with me? And I think sometimes we we think about money and the way we uh, manage our resources as things that we do rather than who it's making us who you're becoming. And so today I want to talk about this, this idea. Uh, it's called have a plan. Have a plan. I'm so excited for this today. And so uh, we're going to read today from Luke chapter 12. Uh, Katie pointed it out last week. We've kind of gotten out of the rhythm. rhythm. It was shame on me for this. But, but I want to I clue you in. At the table, we love to celebrate. It's one of our values. We love to celebrate. And, and when I was in the military, I was thinking about this this morning, when I was in the army, when an officer would walk into the room, everybody would stand. And the reason you'd stand is you would stand out of respect, you would stand out of honor, but you also stood to, to receive the information that he, he or she was about to give you. And so today, um, we don't stand because it's ritual or it's something we have to do. Uh, when we stand to our feet to read God's word, we clap, we celebrate because we are, are showing respect, we are showing honor, we are preparing ourselves to receive the good news that Jesus wants to give us today. So would you stand and celebrate with me as we get to read from Luke chapter 12? I think some of you are here today. Uh, catch up if you're not. Here we go. Luke chapter 12. This is Jesus um, And I love it. It says, someone out of the crowd said, teacher, order my brother to give me a fair share of my family inheritance. Sounds like a family dispute, doesn't it? He replied, I love this. This is so good. We always think Jesus has all the answers. Here's what he says. Mister, what makes you think any of this business is mine to be your judge or your mediator? Speaking to the people. So he turns from the guy who asked them a question, and then he turns to you, and he turns to me, and I love that he says this. He says, take care. Make sure that you protect yourself against the least bit of greed. Life is not defined by what you have. Come on, America. Let's say it one more time. Life is not defined by what you have. Even when you have a lot, Then he told them this story. The farm of a certain rich man produced a terrific terrific crop. This is so funny. He talked to himself. He said, what can I do? My barn isn't big enough for this harvest. Then he said, here's what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. Then I'll I'll gather my grain. I'll gather all the goods. And I'll say to myself, self Let's take a selfie with our barns and our grains. And let's tell everybody how amazing we are. Hashtag barns, grains. I'm awesome. Look at me. Come on, somebody. Self, you've done well. 
You've done so well. Now it's time to take it easy. Sit back. Enjoy yourself. Watch the Bears lose every weekend. Come on. Hopefully the Cubs and the White Sox will bring it around, you know, give you something to watch this year. Just then, God shows up. I love this. After his cool selfie with his, his barns in the background, you know, little filters. Thanks, Apple, to all the filters we could put on the pictures. God shows up and says, you fool. Tonight, you die. And your barn full of goods. Who gets it? Who gets it? That's what happens when you fill your barn with self and not with God. All right. Help me say the title today. I want you to turn to your partner, turn to somebody next to you, put their, your hands on their shoulder, on their shoulder, and say, have a plan. Come on, turn to them, put your hands on the shoulder, and say, have a plan. Have a plan. Have a plan. And you can be seated. You can be seated. Hey, here's what I want to take you today. Um, always want to take you somewhere. I want you to know this message comes uh, from a place of wanting to help you. Whenever I'm here, I want to help you in this. And so he- here's where I want you to know. Here's why I want to take you today. Uh, people who are generous have a plan. People who are generous have a plan. The question that I want to ask you today is this. Do you have a plan? It's really quiet in here. Should I ask it one more time? Uh, Do you have a plan? All right, some of you do. Some of you, it sounds like you're ready to go. You can leave. You don't need this message. Let me say this. I love this. I was reminded when I was writing this and I was thinking about this whole thing that people who are generous have a plan. Took me back to 2001 when I decided it would be a great idea after September 11th to go to Kenya on a missions trip. Now, by the way, I don't know if you know this. People in Kenya, uh, some of them, not a favorite. You know, Americans are not their favorite people. In fact, when we got into Nairobi, uh, the guy who was taking us on the trip said, yeah, the embassy right there, that was bombed just a few years ago. I was like, oh, great. What kind of trip is this? Uh, in fact, it was a challenge of the prefrontal frontal cortex for most of us because we kept doing dumb things. I went with my brother-in-law, you know, and, and he's an eye doctor now, owns his business, but we were so stupid. Uh, we jumped in this river, that, and we were standing at the edge of a waterfall in a bacteria-filled river. I don't know why you would do that, but we did it. One day, uh, the guy who was leading us said, hey, you're free to go. Do whatever you want. And we just thought, well, let's just walk. And so we walked into the bush with no direction and no idea where we were going. We got lost for like 10 hours. And um, the guy who was leading us thought he was going to have to call home and let you know, our parents know that we died in the bush. But, but one of my favorite parts of the trip was this moment where there's this young man, I don't know, he's probably in his 30s, and he said, I want to show you my village. I want to show you my home. And so um, when somebody says they want to show you your home, it's going to be a long walk. And so it, it was really weird. Todd, come up here real, real quick. Yeah, bring your guitar with you. So put your hand down. So when he says, let's go to the village, this is what he did. He was like, come on, man. And so dude is holding my hand. Stop. No, no, no. Dude is holding my hand. And I was like, this is weird. Does this feel weird? All right, go back. <laughs> He's holding my hand. And, and, in, and in Kenya, that means they're your friend, right? Really weird stuff. But it was a way of saying, hey, I own this guy. He's my buddy. Don't touch him. So we went up to this volcano, and then we went in the volcano. It wasn't live. Don't worry. But in there was this, like, grove of banana plants. I don't think they're trees. I think they're plants. I could be wrong. Somebody correct me if I am. They're plants. We were hanging out in this banana grove in a volcano. How cool is that? And then we went up the other side of the mountain, and and there's his little house. And so here's a picture of him. Uh, He introduced us to his family. Go back to his family. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they were so cute. Cute little kids. Amazing little kids. Amazing family. And um, he he said, I want to show you my house. (laughs) Here's a picture of it in the background. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure I can see it. Like, I don't need need to go in. Like, I don't even need... you know, peripheral vision on this. I can, it's right in front of me. I can see it. I don't even know if I'm going to fit in it. And he says, no, I want, I want you to come in. I want you to see my house. And so we ducked down and, you know, you know we went in. And, and, and immediately when you walk through the door, you walk into the kitchen. 
Now, the kitchen is like a pan, a spork, a big spork, and a stove. The stove was, um, the stove was a, a, a bunch of stones with a fire in the middle of it. It's pretty cool. And so then, then he says, I want to show you our bedroom. And he's like, just turn to the right. So we turn to the right, and there it is. And I'm like, yo, dude, there's one bed. You know, we worry about what sleep number we're on. Uh, their sleep number is how many people can we fit in this bed. That's what was going on here. And so, so I said, you guys all sleep in this bed? And he's like, yeah, we do. And I thought, oh, my gosh, how could you live like this? How could you live like this? I mean, I just couldn't do it. But, but he was so proud. He said, I've got plans to, to build my house, and I've got plans to expand, and I've got more goats and more sheep that are on the way. And, and, um, but I'll never forget what he said at the end. He looked at me and with all sincerity said, I want you to know, everything that I have is yours. Everything that I have is yours. You want that straw bed? You can take it with you. You want the spoon, the spork, and the stove? I don't know if you can carry the campfire out, but you can take it with you. You can have my house. If you want to live here, you're welcome to live here. Like everything that I have is yours. And what I understood in this moment was that 100% of what he had, he understood was given to him by God. That God had blessed him. God had given to him. And what he had realized is this isn't mine, but it's meant to bless other people. Because everything that God has given me is yours. It's yours. Because generous people have a plan. Generous people have a plan. In fact, I I love what Isaiah 32, 8 says. It says this. It says, but generous people, you ready for this? Generous people plan Generous people plan. In other words, they put it in their calendar. They, 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 they do the whole, you know, uh, bank transfer right away. They just prepare ahead of time. They planned to be generous. Generosity just doesn't happen. You have to plan for it. And I love this. And not only do they do that, not only do they plan for it, they stand firm in their generosity. Oh, you see, see, when you stand firm in something, it's because it comes from your identity. When you stand firm in something, it comes from an understanding of knowing who you are, not what you do. You see, I stand firm because I am, I am generous, and nobody can move me from it. I love this. A, a pastor I, I love very much and respect recently said, he said, um, he said, givers are prompted Generous people plan. Givers are prompted. Generous people plan. Let me give you an example. I didn't believe him on this, but he was right. That, that, around that time, we get a little, you know, doorbell ring, and there's this little girl standing outside of our house, and Janelle answers the door, and she's like, it's the Girl Scout girls. I love these guys. Oh, boy, here we go. And so she opens the door and she gets down on her knee, you know, you know, she's a great teacher. She knows, she's making contact with this little girl and she says, oh, sweetie, what do you have for me today? And, um, and so, she, you know, she's like, well, would you buy some Girl Scout cookies? And I'm like, babe, no, no, you can get them at Aldi's for $1.29. Like you're going to spend $10 for this box of cookies that you can buy at Aldi's. Don't do it. And she's like, oh, yeah, um, I like the Thin Mints. I'll take two of those. My husband, even though he doesn't want to pay you, loves the tag-alongs. Give me, like, two of those. And she's ordering all these boxes of cookies. And here's what I know. I spent, like, $40 that day on Girl Scout cookies. Why? Because I was prompted. I was prompted to give. Not because I wanted to give. No offense, Girl Scouts. I know you all good and you do amazing things. I don't have girls. I don't care about what the Girl Scouts do. Like, there's not a plan in my bone that says I would love to be generous to the Girl Scouts. But in this moment, my wife, oh, give me the Thin Mints, give me the Tagalongs. Honey, get the checkbook. Prompted. Prompted. Baited. Oh, man. 
We aren't going to be able to feed our kids, but tag alongs and thin mints for two weeks straight. See, see, I was really uncomfortable because you don't want to say no to this girl. Let's just be honest for a minute. Can we, can we have an honest conversation between the two of us or all of us? Some of you, you, you come in today and um, some of y'all, you just skipped out today because you knew we were talking about this. Sorry. But you come in and, and I get it. Like there's this realization that, that when we begin to talk about finances and resources, some of us get a little bit, we, we get a little, you know, it's like, ooh, it's just weird. It's just kind of grimy, you know, like what? you feel like your face getting a little flush. There's like a little bit of pressure in this and you're starting to feel prompted in the moment. Can I, can I just say this? If you feel pressure or you feel prompted in this moment, it's because you don't have a plan. If you feel prompted in this moment, it's because you don't have a plan. And remember what I said. I mean, I'm not saying it, but I'm saying it. Generous people have a plan. Generous people have a plan. And what I also know is this. There are just as many people here today who when I walk out today will say, Man, Pastor, I love it when you give these messages about giving. Like, we have a number of people who'd be really uncomfortable. We have the same number of people who will come in today and they'll say, Man, I love it when you give these messages. I love it when you challenge me. I love it when you talk about being generous. I love it when God begins to, to ask me to give more to people. In fact, we just have people in this church who often I'll say to our staff, Hey, you want to pay for something? Just go ask them because they'll help you out, I promise. You know how we get a switch and and a hoverboard for our Halloween extravaganza that we do every year? It's not because the church has money to buy that stuff. It's because somebody said, yo, I'll cover that cost. I don't mind. I don't care. And what I love about generous people is it's not what they do. It's, It's just part of who they are. They schedule it in. It's part of their identity. It's something they value. They know, hey, I am generous. So, so today, I want to help you. I want you to have a plan. I want you to walk away here today with a plan in mind because I know deep down that you are generous. And now I'm looking at a bunch of young people and y'all think this isn't for me. I'm just going to tell you right now, I wish somebody would have given me this message a long time ago. This will set your future on the right trajectory. But I want to acknowledge something that we, we have to talk about. Can, can we, real talk, here we go. Ready? The plan that we're currently on is the one that says we'll make it work. The we'll make it work plan. Do you know which one I'm talking about? Okay, I'll get to it in a minute. But just so you know that I'm not lying, let me give you some stats. 54% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. What's even crazier is that 40% of people who are high earners, meaning they make over $100,000, 40% of those people live paycheck to paycheck. In fact, I was doing a study on millennials. Sorry, millennials. I didn't mean to pick on you. It just happened to come up. But here's what's so interesting. You know when we had that phase when we were calling old people Karens and Kens? You remember this? No? Okay. We're trying to forget it. I get it. Well, the tides have turned, ladies and gentlemen, because there are people who have a name for millennials, and we're called Henrys. It means high earner, not rich yet. High earner, not rich. Yo, right here. Come on, somebody. Any millennials out there? I'm on the verge. Henrys. And here's what they found. What they found was it wasn't a lack of money. It wasn't a lack of money. It was their lifestyle choices. This is good. What they found was that whenever there was a rise in their discretionary income, they would increase, increase their standard of living. Does that make sense? Okay, let's put it in real time. We're all dumpy and stats and heady. Here we go, real time. A few years ago, I had some friends who decided that they wanted to get fit, and part of the fit plan was cooking and cookware that was healthy for you. This was the time when we were aware that, um, you know, the nonstick stuff just meant that you were going to get cancer. You can eat all the spinach and all the the broccoli that you want, but cooked in this pan, you're still going to die. 
And so they went out and they bought this copper cookware set that was thousands of dollars. And then they had us over for dinner and not just to have dinner, but try to sell us on the idea of buying a cookware set as well. And I said, how much did you spend for this? And they said, oh, it was a lot of money. And they told me the amount. And I said, how do you expect me to buy that? And they said this. They said, we'll make it work. Well, what do you mean? Well, we've just come to this agreement that that we won't go out to eat for like the next 20 years. Next week, I see him at McDonald's, you know? It's like, get real. Like, we'll make it work. Get real. And we like to point fingers. It's easy to point fingers at them, but let's point fingers at ourselves for a minute. We do this all the time. Come on. How many times we'll make it work plan? Have you gone into the car dealership And the car dealer begins to talk you into a payment that you know you can't afford. Okay, I'm the only one. I guess I'm the idiot. Okay, we got one back there. Thank you very much. Like, like you go in and you've you've experienced this. Like, they're talking to you and you're shifting money around in your mind. You haven't worked it out on paper, but you can feel your blood pressure rising. You can feel your your face getting flush. It's like your mind's telling you, I know I shouldn't do this. This is not the wise thing to do. But if I feed my kid every other day, I will save $250 and I can drive in style. Little Detroit lean to go with. Are you with me? Okay. Some of you, you do this um, with your phones, right? I need a new phone. Why do you need a new phone? Because it's new. Not because I need one, just because it's new. And we go in and it's like, ah, yeah, I know. It's like only $35 a month and, and, and I, can, I can make it work. We'll make it work. I, I think to myself that for so many of us, we maximize every penny for things that don't matter. And here's what I know about you and me is that when we follow the we'll make it work plan, What we're doing is aligning our lives with what we worship. On the will make it work plan, you are aligning your life with what you worship. And so Jesus knows this about you and me. In fact, I love it. Coming back to the story, they were dealing with the same thing 2,000 years ago. They were looking at rich people who had money and they were trying to be like them and yet their finances felt elusive. And Jesus is saying, don't buy it. I love what he says here. Let's go back to it around real quick. He says, take care. Protect yourself against the least bit of greed. Life is not defined by what you have even if you have a lot. And he continues. And this is from the NIV. I love this. It says, man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Man's life does not consist in the abundance of their possessions. Now, I know you're like, duh. Duh. I don't need the Bible to tell me that. I got Super Bowl commercials from Expedia. Remember this, the guy's walking through the screen set and he's like, you won't remember you by the TV screen that you bought. And then he walks out the door, but they'll remember you by the vacations you took. Duh, I don't need to, I mean, thanks Super Bowl commercial, I got it. But but here's what I love. Sometimes when we read scripture, we read it with a boring mind. God has given you a brain to get creative with it. In fact, when you begin to look at scripture, it's okay to do this. In fact, uh, the ancient Hebrews used to do this. They would take scripture and it was like a prism. They would see all sides of it. And I was like, God, make this real to me. Make it, make it, just say it differently to me. And so as I began to read it, this is the way I read it. The abundant life, the abundant life does not consist of possessions. You see, so when a man's life, when a man's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions, I'm like, got it. But when you say the abundant life does not consist of possessions, it cha- it's, some of you are like, bro, that's just semantics. No, see, for me, it changes everything. When you put the word abundant in front of life instead of in front of your possessions, it changes your perspective about the way you're supposed to live. In fact, I know this. When, when Jesus says the word abundant, it means to exceed the ordinary, It just doesn't mean you have a lot. It means you get to exceed the ordinary. 
you should be pumped about this. What Jesus is saying in this moment is I have been calling you to life to the full. I'm asking you to live abundant life. I'm asking you to not be average. Stop settling for mediocrity on the next purchase that you want to buy. He says, why do you want to be average? Average is for boring people. Boring people suck. I I don't mean to say that. Can I? I said it. Oh, well. Sorry, guys. There we go. But Jesus in this moment says, guys, like, focus in here. Like, there is a way that you can begin to live that, that moves you beyond the average life. And it's not in the things that you buy. It's not in the next car that you have. It's not in the next phone that you're going to make a phone call on or make your next post on. Like, that stuff doesn't matter. I know you know that. But what we don't know is that the, the, the life that is, that is full, the life that is passionate, the life that is real, the life that is beyond mediocrity and everyone else starts with generosity. I love this. You, you, see, you see, average people focus on possessions. Average, average people focus on possessions. Exceeding the ordinary people have a plan to be generous. So which plan do you have? Oh, you got a plan. Which one do you have? So I want to end our time together by asking you a question. I'm not going to ask you permission. I'm just going to do it, okay? Sometimes I ask permission up here. I don't need to do that today. Here's what I know. A godless life is an empty life. But a life that's committed to generosity, starting with Jesus, is so full. It exceeds the ordinary. And so Jesus looks at you and me, and he asks this question. Who gets it? You, you, you heard this question earlier? Remember this? Who gets it? In fact, Ron, let's go back to the scripture. At the end of this man's life, Jesus walks into his big barn full of grains, look at me selfie, and says, just then God showed up, and he says, tonight you die. You're an idiot. You're stupid. And your barn full of goods. Say it with me. Who gets it? One more time. Who gets it? You see... I think Jesus poses it two different ways. You see, if you're an average person, if you're just an average person, if you're a selfish person, if you're filling your barns with just you, then, then, then you, you ask this question. Yeah, like, in the end, who gets it? This is why families have fights over stuff. Stuff. Is because when you are filled with self, you're saying, who's going to get it? Am I going to get it? Oh, I can't wait till they die. I get their house. I get their cars. Yo, my sister not getting a thing. Who gets it? But generous people. Generous people. People who live with, with this understanding that I am generous and that God has blessed me. And that everything that I have is yours. Says, God, who, who gets it? Who gets it? Who can I give it to? How can I give it away? Whose future can I make better? How can I bless somebody's life in a way that only you could do it, not me? Who gets it, God? Who gets it? See, see which way are you asking it? Because it changes. It changes who you are. So today, I want to leave you with a plan. I don't want to leave you hanging. But it starts by saying this together. I am generous. Say it with me. I am generous. One more time. I am generous. Doesn't that feel good? I am generous. I love that. Who gets it, God? Who gets it? I cannot wait. And because you are generous, you have a plan. And here's your plan. Listen, this is just a starting point. 
This is not an ending. You can adjust the numbers in the right direction. Come on now. But here's the plan. I live by the 100 plan. I live by the 100 plan. And it goes like this. 10, 10, 80. That 10% of what, what I bring in every single week, every single month that God has blessed me with is not mine. It's his. And so I give him my first and I give him my best. And I let God do the rest. So we, we Janelle and I, I'll just be up front. We, we give more than the 10 but this is where we started in our marriage. We said, we're going to commit no matter what's going on in our life that we will give 10% to the church that we attend, to our faith community. And then we committed to saving 10%. And then we lived on the 80. Now those numbers adjust over time as your generosity meter changes. Sometimes it's 20, 20, 60, however you'd like to do it. But this is the starting point. And some of you, like David said earlier, you want me to give 10%? And I want to ask you, who gets it? Who gets it? You can't afford not to give God your first and your best. Oh, let me ask you a question. Amazon going to bless your finances? Walmart going to bless your finances? Is the gas pump going to bless your finances at $5 a gallon? Have you been there? Woo! No. They're just going to take your money. They'll take every, they will take 100% of everything you have if you let them. So, tithe 10, save 10, spend the rest. And I know you're like, Brad, I know, here it comes. Shh, it's the point where he's going to ask us to give, right, Mitch? Listen, I'm not going to ask you to do that. I want you to pray about God's plan for you. Today, this week, the only thing that I'm asking you to do, this is how much I believe in it. I'm not asking you to give today. I'm not asking you to bring 10%. Today. All I'm doing is asking for you to pray about God's plan for you. God, make me a generous person. Give me a plan. And thank pastor for giving it to me, right? We give it to you. But pray about this plan this week. Mull it over in your mind. Ask God, how am I obedient? What can I do? What do you want me to do? What's the best way to start? And if you're in this place and in this moment saying to me, Brad, I can't do that right now. And if you're saying, I don't want to do that right now, then, then I know deep down it's a heart issue. And you actually cannot, I'll just say this carefully, you actually cannot be a generous person without God having 100% of you. So maybe your next move is not to give. Maybe your next move is simply to give your life to Jesus. Oh, I'm not shy about this. I am not afraid of this. I know some of y'all are ready to duck out. I do not care. Listen, I want you to know today that when Jesus looks you in the face and he sees your experience and he understands your brokenness and he sees your hurting, he sees your addiction, he sees that person that you're dating and it's like, my goodness, like it is so broken that I don't even know if I can, repeat. like I, he gets it. And he's asking like, why? Why would you give yourself to those things when I could give you life to the full? When I could allow you to exceed the ordinary? Listen, do you want to be more than average? I know I do. I do not want to be average. I do not want to live a life of mediocrity. I have committed my life to doing something great, not because of me, not because of my cool barns, but because God has given me a passion. He has given me a joy. I'm a son who has been set free. And because of that, I will live with an undying passion and an undefeatable joy. And I want that for you too. You are his son. You are his daughter. And he has come to set you free. 
And because of that, you can live with an undying passion and an undefeatable joy. Don't let anybody squash you in the moment that you're in. There, there is something inside of you that Jesus can give you. And all you have to say is, today, I give you my life. Today, I give you 100. That's it. Welcome to the family. We love you. We love you. In fact, I'll just say this. On your way out, at our next steps area there on our TV, there's a screen that says, tell us about your next step. If you have made a decision to give God 100 today, I want to know about it. All you have to do is scan the QR code. So fun, so easy. Tell me your name. Tell me your story. I want to know what God's doing in your life. So next week, Next week, my good friend, Pastor Nate's going to be here. We're having an intermission. Woo! Come on, can we celebrate that? Um, I've never done this before. We have this series going. We're going to have an intermission. And if you've not met Big Nate, you need to meet Big Nate. This dude's going to bring it down next week. He's not talking about giving. He's just talking about what God's doing. And it's going to be good. And then I'll come back a week after that, and we'll finish this series out. Y'all have been amazing. Can I pray for you? And then we're going to stand and sing one song together. God, we are so grateful for your grace and your mercy in this moment. God, I am grateful that you are a God who says, uh, let's end the average stuff. Let's get over the, the little things that don't matter. But in this moment, you are calling us to a life that is beyond what we could dream of. And so today we give you 100% of who we are whether it's with our life or whether it's with the resources that you've given us. All that we have is yours. God, I pray this week that as we leave, you would impress upon our hearts this question of who gets it? Who gets it? And if we can answer that, we might be on the right path. Would you guide us with your spirit, with your wisdom, and with your power? And it's in the name of Jesus we pray this. Amen. 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 You guys have been so awesome. Thanks for letting me riff for a little bit. Would you stay? If this message challenged you and moved you forward, personally or in faith, we encourage you to share it with someone who needs a message of hope today. And if you're interested or looking for ways to partner with us in our mission here at the table, head on over to thetablejoliet.org for more information.